Hi, I'm Dylan Campolo, Senior Tour Guide here at the Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum, and today we're going to be talking about one of the most legendary aircraft in our collection, the British Airways Concorde. Concorde was a joint project between the British and French governments. The first time that a human being is recorded as moving faster than the speed of sound in an airplane is 1947. Chuck Yeager flying the Bell X-1 breaks the infamous sound barrier. Of course, as is usual with technology, it trickles down from the military to the civilian spheres. As early as the 1950s, as the military is beginning to use supersonic technology in their, in their aircraft, the commercial airlines become interested in using it to take passengers to the destinations that they want to go. So after designing prototype, the British government realizes that their friendly rivals across the channel are developing a very similar prototype and they decide to partner. In 1962, the Anglo-French agreement is signed. This agreement is going to spell out everything involving the building and and selling of Concorde. They decide that certain parts of the plane will be built by the British Aircraft Corporation in the United Kingdom and that other parts of the plane will be built all over France. After initial interest from many airlines, including the leading airline around the world, Pan American, lengthy development times combined with rising costs will cause most of these airlines to cancel their options. As a result, the only two airlines to purchase Concorde are the British Airways and Air France. In total, 20 airframes were built, six of them pre-production and prototypes, and 14 purchased to fly commercially between British Airways and Air France, split right down the middle with seven apiece. Today, 18 remain around the world. Tragically, a Concorde crashed in July of 2000 after taking off from Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris, France, and Air France also tore another one of their airframes apart for spare pieces. Concorde's last commercial flight was in 2003, flying passengers around the globe for 27 years. Uh, the plane is 202 feet long, nose to tail, and then from wingtip to wingtip it is 84 feet wide. You have a really nice shot of Concorde's modified Delta Wing. Uh, early in supersonic research, they realized that from a physics standpoint, a triangular or delta wing configuration was ideal for limiting drag at supersonic speeds. Uh, the issue that they ran into with Concorde was that they needed a modified delta wing. So they referred to the, the gentle sloping curves of the wing uh, as, as an ogival delta wing. With all delta wings, you run into issues traveling at subsonic speeds, very low speeds to be specific. Uh, the only way to generate enough lift at low speeds is to have a very high angle of attack to pitch the airplane up high. And this utilizes a phenomenon associated with the delta wing, which is vortex lift. Vortices create areas of low pressure uh, above the wing, which will give you lift at the slow speeds, which would be taking off and landing. Uh, the problem with pitching up the wing and therefore the nose very high on takeoff and landing is the pilots had trouble seeing. Initially, they installed periscopes on the planes. Needless to say, the pilots weren't too happy with uh, looking down through a periscope on these critical points of their flight. So they eventually came up with another unique feature of the aircraft, which is the droop snoot, or the fact that the nose at the very front of the plane bent down uh, on takeoff and landing to allow the pilots to see. Concorde was equipped with four Rolls-Royce turbojet engines, and with 32,000 pounds of thrust each, this was enough to keep Concorde at its cruising speed of Mach 2.0, or two times the speed of sound. Unique to Concorde was the presence of afterburners, or reheats, on each one of the engines. These are typical features of turbojet engines on military aircraft, but Concorde is the only commercial plane to make use of them on their flight. What an afterburner does is it uh, reintroduces fuel to the exhaust of the engine, uh, and then sets it on fire one more time to give you a very strong burst of thrust, uh, about 20% extra power. Concorde only used them at two points of their flight, takeoff and to burn through an area of high drag called the transonic zone. The physics of supersonic flight uh, means that the airframe is sub subjected to a lot of heat and Concorde is made out of a special type of aluminum alloy that is resistant to the heat that would be generated on the airframe. We're talking uh, around the windows, you know, a couple inches from the passenger's faces, about 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, portions of the leading edge of the wing and the nose uh, being even greater than that. There was actually an automatic feature on the aircraft that would slow the plane down in the event that it got to a critical heating point. And this was the main limiting factor on Concorde speed. That's why they chose that magic number of Mach 2.0. Any faster, more heat's generated on the airframe, have to make the plane out of different materials like the titanium that our A12 is made of here at the museum. And then you run into a whole different set of issues. But of course, when metal heats up before it melts, obviously it, it's going to expand. 
There was only one really visible marker of that expansion on Concorde, and it was the expansion joint located here in the flight deck. So the gap, once the plane was at its cruising speed of Mach 2.0, uh, was quite substantial. We're talking maybe six to eight inches. But on the last flights for a lot of the airframes, uh, we do know that the flight engineer, if not the entire crew, would leave their caps in this gap or one cap signed by all of them. When the plane landed and cooled and the metal contracts and the gap closed, the hat was then stuck there, I think in their minds for eternity. And we know that Alpha Delta here did have one of those caps in this gap, uh, but it is currently in our collection storage being safeguarded so that we can display it uh, for as long as we possibly can. Concorde primarily flew transatlantic, so you would find yourself flying mostly out of London Heathrow and Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris uh, for regularly scheduled flights, and you were most likely going to a destination on the eastern seaboard of the United States. Most popular destination was, of course, New York, but Washington, D.C. was also quite popular at the time. The experience of flying on Concorde was luxury to a T. Service was first class, if, if not better. You're going to have three meals on what averaged out to a three and to three and a half hour flight. The price of the ticket was obviously above first class as well. Initially, British Airways is charging about 20% more than the cost of a first class ticket for that same route on, let's say, a 747. This led to a very specific type of culture that surrounded the aircraft. Not only did you have frequent flyers that saw each other often and uh, were quite collegial, uh, the flight crew was also very interested in fostering relationships with these people and they would allow them to visit the flight deck. And of course you had your fair share of celebrities uh, that flew the aircraft. The specific Concorde Alpha Delta or G-BOAD is a record holder. On February 7th, 1996, flying from John F. Kennedy here in New York City to London Heathrow, Captain Leslie Scott, First Officer Tim Orchard, and Chief Engineer Rick Eads made it to London in two hours, 52 minutes, and 59 seconds. That's the fastest that a commercial airliner has ever made it across the Atlantic Ocean. Leslie Scott lives in New York City today, a retired pilot, and he is a member of the museum. What it really boils down to, they told us when we interviewed them, is a very fortuitous tailwind that they had heading over to London on that day. They realized that they were gonna have it because on their way into New York City the day before, there was a very strong headwind that slowed them down. So they were doing all the math and checking out the weather before their flight and they realized that this was going to be one of their quicker flights across the Atlantic. And there's always a spirit of friendly competition, or at least there was for the Concorde pilots insofar as getting that fastest flight. And they thought that maybe this was their shot. Uh, the tailwind helped them out, but what it really boiled down to at the end was Tim Orchard calling in some favors with the connections that he had for air traffic control at Heathrow Airport. Meaning when they got pretty close, uh, they may or may not have uh, went supersonic for a little longer than they should have, but uh, they were allowed, they were cleared to land eastbound, meaning they didn't have to circle around and then land going west. Uh, Alpha Delta was also the workhorse of not only British Airways, but really of the entire Concorde fleet. Uh, between British Airways and Air France, there were about 80,000 flights flown, and Alpha Delta flew by itself 8,000, so that's 10% of all the flights flown between both fleets. So Concorde service ended in 2003, and the various airplanes were distributed to museums around the world. Alpha Delta arrived here at the Intrepid Museum in January of 2004 and opened its doors to the public. If you want to experience Concorde today, come on down to the museum and take a guided tour. For more behind the scenes videos, visit intrepidmuseum.org.